So let's talk about some behavioral experiments and what they tell us about face recognition. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you one of my favorite stories. Robert Yin got his PhD in this department in 1969. Imagine the technology that was available then. He used the extraordinarily amazing and high-tech method of paper and pencil. He showed people pictures of faces and scenes um, and bodies and other things, and he asked them to recognize them. That was his method, and he discovered really deep, important things. He's, the, he's maybe not quite the first, but one of the very first people to suggest that there might be special yeah. mechanisms in the brain for face recognition. And he did that with paper and pencil. That's awesome. Okay, here's what he did. Okay, oh, we're gonna start with a demo. Um, all right, I'm gonna show you um, six faces upside down, and you're gonna look at them. I'm gonna give you a few seconds, so look at all of them, and just make a tally of how many of them you recognize and write it down. Okay, everybody ready? Look at the screen, you only have a few seconds. Ready, here we go. Oh yeah, don't blur down any names. Here we go. Okay, write it down. Okay, now next, let's do it again. Write down how many you recognize. Okay, stop looking, just write down the number here. Okay, how many people recognized more in the second display than the first? Raise your hand if you, oh good. That's the face inversion effect. Okay, now I cheated in this demo it's important to cheat in demos, otherwise they don't always work. No, I'm just kidding. I cheated in this demo by showing you the upright faces second. Um, but if you do this in a, a proper controlled experiment, it works just as well. People are much better able to recognize upright faces than inverted faces. Okay? Um, and that's what Robert Yin showed in 1969. It's called the face inversion effect. His experiment was a little you know, more structured than that, so let me tell you what he did. He gave uh, people a bunch of faces to study, like 20, unfamiliar faces they hadn't seen before. And they had a few se seconds to study each one, and that takes a few minutes. And then he gives them a test. Which of these two did you see before? Which of these two did you see before? And he measures how well people do, okay? He does that whole thing with the faces upright or the whole thing with the faces inverted. That's better than the version I just ran on you because after all, you probably haven't seen Ronald Reagan upside down before, right? And so, okay, that's unfamiliar. But in Robert Yin's experiment, you'd study them inverted and test them inverted, or study them upright and test them upright. So that gave the system the same shot. Um, there wasn't a change between study and test. And nonetheless, he found that people made more errors. This is number of errors uh, when the faces were inverted um, at study and test than when they were upright at study and test. Okay, everybody got that? Okay, very simple experiment. Now, does this tell us that faces are special? Please. So you first see this and you think, oh, that's weird. That's interesting. That sounds diagnostic. But you have to show that it's diagnostic. You have to do the same thing on other classes of stimuli. If you want to use this as an argument, not just to say that our representation of faces is orientation sensitive, this does show that, but if we want to further know, does that make faces different, we have to test other things. And of course, Robert Yin did that. Okay, so here's what he found for houses and stick figures of bodies. Okay, so he found an inversion effect, but it was smaller. Okay, so it's not like there is no inversion effect for things that aren't faces, and much depends on the details of the experiment. It's just a larger inversion effect for faces than other things. Okay, so it could hardly be more low-tech than this. The simplest possible experiment, but it really has a deep kernel of insight, both about the nature of the representations of faces we extract and have in our heads, uh, and about the idea that, we, that whatever we do with faces is somehow fundamentally different than what we do with non-faces, or at least maybe different. I don't know about fundamentally, maybe slightly overstating it from this alone. Okay, everybody got that? All right. Um, all right. Um, so he actually inferred from this that there are special brain mechanisms for face recognition, which is pretty amazing, back in, back in 1969 with no scanner, no nothing. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, so here's another version of the face inversion effect. Um, so if you look at these two stimuli, just look at them for a while, 
Raise your hand if you see anything bizarre. Oh, a few of you have all seen this in 900, right? No? Okay, it's going to get more bizarre. Okay, we're going to turn them upside down. Boom. Looks okay. Boom. Oh, not okay. Okay, if it looked bizarre to you before, does it look worse now? <laughs> okay, so that's called the Thatcher illusion. It's another version of the face inversion effect. Another way to show that our whole face system is prepared and ready and designed to deal with upright faces, and it does that much better than inverted faces. Okay? Important clues about about algorithm, computation, and hardware implementation, I mean, in inferences about hardware inf implementation.